be here this morning. I, I'll, I'll admit to you right now, I don't know Long Island Sound very well. Uh, I grew up on Chesapeake. I went to graduate school at URI and spent a lot of years in, on Narragansett Bay. So Long Island Sound was usually just that thing out the Amtrak window uh, going between home and otherwise. But uh, uh, I, I want to thank you all also. I'm just thinking about the mayor's comments earlier on. Um, I want to thank all of you, both the professionals and volunteers, uh, uh, for your service to estuaries and to the coast and to the sound. Uh, I have a favorite saying, which is from Dante, and it says that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of great moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. Um, so, uh, and I always like to quote that to politicians who, uh, who are sitting on their hands and not doing anything in, in uh, you know, in the face of these very evident challenges. Um, Don talked about the study that we did with the National Fish and Wildlife Serve, uh, uh, Foundation. Um, I'm going to talk about just very generally some of the findings. Uh, I would encourage you all to go look at the report itself. It's very detailed, um, and I don't want to go through a whole list of all the findings, but um, it was a very rapid assessment. Uh, we did it right after the storm. Um, the uh, NIFWF asked us to focus on the physical effects on coastal habitats and species which depend on them. Uh, it, you know, very quickly, and um, try to identify realistic opportunities to address and remediate the challenges that we found. So, being an advocate and being an activist, really, what we had in mind was not only to have a better understanding of what the storm did to habitats from the Delaware Bay up to Long Island Sound, but to position ourselves to, to talk to Congress, to talk to the White House, because we knew that there would be a response. And we also knew, unfortunately, that the environment Coastal habitat often gets the short end of the stick in terms of response monies that come come forward. Um, the, uh, the the approach that we used was to rely upon uh, probably some of you in the room here. Um, uh, uh, Susan Kennedy, who was uh, actually a member of my board of trustees and then worked for me, and now as a private consultant, did the interviews. She, we tried to find as many folks as we could who weren't out in the field trying to figure out what's going on with their own uh, resources, uh, get their perspectives. Uh, we also did a very interesting study with uh, Rutgers University. Um, the chairman of my board is the director of the Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis. And so he used uh, satellite imagery, remote sensing, uh, the overflights that were done by NOAA and USGS, uh, both prior and after the storm, to do this analysis of how the resources had changed. And again, we were sort of looking mostly at the physical effects, the physical changes to the habitats. Um, and then try to you know, prepare some of that. Um, so this is, these are not great images, but it kind of gives you uh, a sense of how, how it was done. Um, um, and this is available uh, on Ed Ruffers at the Crystal website. You can look at this and, and kind of drill down into it a little bit more. Uh, we were also trying to create a database, you know, very, very quickly, obviously, that we hope could be used by, uh, by resource managers and by other folks that are interested in this. Um, so on the, on sort of the regional level, um, the findings were pretty much what you would expect, right? Uh, the, most of the impact to the natural features that we looked at, beaches, dunes, tidal marshes, uh, maritime forests, um, occurred on the ocean front, occurred on the beaches themselves. Um, again, there's a regional distribution. When you look at the report, you'll see there's, a, there's analytical maps in there that show the difference between what happened on the Delaware Bay, on the Atlantic coast of New Jersey, the Hudson Raritan estuary in Long Island Sound. Uh, but, but again, you know, not unexpectedly, most of the impact was on beach and dune areas. Uh, tidal marshes took a fairly um, good hit, but, um, but also uh, proved to be fairly resilient, which is what we would expect as well. Um, and then lastly, we looked at Dublin Forest, sort of in proximity to the coast. And I always uh, try to caution that this number is fairly small, but I wouldn't want to undermine that or understate, I think, what the ecological implications are given how precarious our coastal forests are. Um, big gaps in them obviously create opportunities for invasives and other problems that go in and disrupt the habitat value. So, um, again, I, I apologize. These are images primarily from New Jersey, uh, not Long Island Sound, but this is, a, this is actually the town where my family has a beach house. Luckily, uh, we were either poor enough or smart enough, which way you want to look at it, that our house is about a mile and a half from the beach, so we didn't suffer this. But, uh, this is the main road on the ocean front, and you can see you know, the impact of the storm uh, um, on the buildings. Uh, you can see the one house up in the, uh, right up here. There were houses here, and, and restaurants and commercial uh, space here. The main road is actually here. Uh, 
Um, then I looked in the town on a very thin barrier island, breached uh, during the storm. Uh, and then a little fishing town on Barney Bay, and I was completely under the water. This is where my office is. Uh, uh, Kurt asked me to think about, I'm sorry, Don asked me to think about what was a memory. Uh, my offices are on Sandy Hook. Um, in the park there, uh, I vividly remember standing there the day before the storm. I'd gone out, I pulled out the three pieces of artwork that didn't had any value that had been given to us in the last 50 years, and the servers. I remember looking at the building thinking this is probably the last time I was going to see it. Uh, Sandy Hook was completely overwashed, um, um, but, uh, but the building somehow survived. So these are, I'm just going to run through these. Um, Prime hooked in on the Delaware Bay. Kibbles Beach, this is a main spawning area for bush crabs and a migratory bird stopover, which is very important. Um, and here's a Long Island Sound instance um, that kind of proves the point about um, how those natural features, uh, where they were intact. Uh, one of the findings was that they, that they functioned as we expected. They absorbed the storm energy and they often protected the communities that were next to them. So this is what it looks like when you, when you put all the different habitats together. Um, and look at it on a regional basis and the distribution of the, of the, of the impacts and changes. Region-wide, um, um, inland modification due to beach erosion. Um, I think the most interesting one is this idea of new and moved habitat where um, sand was redistributed, the beaches were gone. Um, primarily, we'll talk about this in the panel, I think, because most of the ways that we try to manage these resources in these areas are static. Um, and so we're very concerned about whether or not we're going to respond to the fact that there's now new habitat in places that there wasn't before. Uh, the debris and rack on the marsh systems, and then obviously the uh, um, last one here, the vulnerability, uh, sort of the rush to rebuild and what that implies um, <coughs> for the habitats. Uh, good news, strong evidence that natural coastal features responded well with storm providing mitigation. Um, lessons learned. Uh, we obviously picked up this evidence and have started to try to make the argument um, that uh, we should be restoring these areas, we should be expanding the protection of them where they still in their natural state and open space. We should be accelerating our acquisition there as one of our primary strategies to sort of face the future. Um, as I said, the, the bad news is that there really isn't a lot of recognition of the creation of new habitat. Um, everybody wants to go back to what it looked like on October 28th and use that as the benchmark. Um, and then, um, again, the rush to rebuild, uh, people using bulldozers on the beaches to push the sand up to protect the houses that are still there. Um, you know, at the same time, the piping bulldozers are starting to come back and look for those overwash areas that has happened now. So these are, uh, uh, if you look at the report, there's a very detailed inventory of the impacted sites, the data set about the analysis, and then, uh, again, our hope is that we use this information to integrate it into the response, uh, particularly the decisions about where the money's going to be allocated. There are recommendations from the Habitat Work Group um, that we picked up and included in the, uh, in the report. Um, and uh, I thank you for your time. <laughs>